Welcome Eden community and friends to this day three of Eden's spring 2021 convocation. This is what theology looks like, public ministries of resilience and solidarity, celebrating Eden Seminary's membership and connection with the progressive Christian movement. We are delighted today to be offering a live forum with a lecture, our Brueggemann lecture for spring convocation with a dear friend of Eden Seminary. And we are delighted to have Professor Steve Patterson, stranger to uh, really no one in the Eden community. And uh, we are just, Steve, I just wanna welcome you and thank you for being here. It's really great to see you. Thanks, thanks, Deb. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here, really. Well, we, we, are, we are delighted to have you uh, in our spring convocation and your, uh, your topic for today is such a great connection uh, for our entire forum, uh, the, the idea of solidarity and ministry, public ministry, the progressive Christian movement. I'm going to go ahead, Steve, and if I may, offer a formal introduction for you. And then I'm going to uh, hand it over to you uh, for our lecture. Dr. Stephen J. Patterson is the George H. Atkinson Professor of Religious and Ethical Studies at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. As a scholar of international renown on the Gospel of Thomas, the Jesus movement, the historical Jesus, and Christian origins, Dr. Patterson, a member of the Jesus Seminar and the West Star Institute is the author of many books. Most notably for this audience of many Eden alumni, The God of Jesus, a monograph he published while on the faculty at Eden and that informed the formation of decades, literally, of Eden grads, many of whom are eagerly here, probably with their dog-eared copies of that book nearby today. He is the author of the forthcoming commentary in the premier English language scholarly series, Hermeneia, with Fortress Press on the Gospel of Thomas. You know, the big orange one. And currently, he is the author of several works making this technical erudition available to mere mortals like the rest of us for practical engagement in the progressive Christian movement and in practical ecclesiology. The Lost Way, How Two Forgotten Gospels Are Rewriting the Story of Christian Origins, with Harper One really opening up uh, the Q source and the Gospel of Thomas for the progressive Christian movement. And most recently, The Forgotten Creed, Christianity's original struggle against bigotry, slavery, and sexism with Oxford University Press. By the way, this wonderful book is the winner of the 2020 Graumeyer Prize in Religious Studies, I believe Religious Studies. And uh, what a great honor that is for Professor Patterson. And we celebrate that accomplishment with you, Steve. We're very, very proud of you. Dr. Patterson 
is a scholar of, of course, technical erudition and has worked at his craft of his thought and his writing to the point where, in my experience, he can make the complex, plural, and diverse context of Christian origins very clear. And the reading experience of reading one of Steve's books to be like going on a journey with a good friend and guide, resulting in a series of aha moments where the opportunity is always richly present to draw the reading and learning into the significance of such learning and discovery for the reader's context. I had the joy of reading Dr. Patterson's latest work, The Forgotten Creed, with our beloved Saint of Eden, now departed colleague and friend, Reverend Dr. Marilyn Stavanger, who taught contextual education here for many years and was a colleague to both of us and just a great mentor to all of us on the faculty. In the season of her life before she died, we were able to acquire galley copies of Steve's new book, thanks to he and his publisher. And we would read a chapter every week together. By the way, it is a perfect tome for just such an exercise for book study groups, uh, adult education offerings, uh, really wonderfully set up for that way of reading in a group. And we would read a chapter every week and would feast, as you know, only Marilyn could, on the implications of Steve's insights and teaching for the life of the church, the mission of Eden Seminary and our curriculum. She had quite a few opinions about that. And of course, for the educational ministry and mission ministry of her beloved congregation, Peace United Church of Christ, where Steve and his wife, Reverend Dr. Deb Patterson and their two children, John and Sophia, were members when they lived here in St. Louis. The solidarity that Peace United Church of Christ is currently living out in its life with the leadership of Reverend Wendy Bruner as a Freedom School congregation and in its Black Lives Matters vigils every Friday evening, which have inspired many other churches to do so along Lockwood, I believe can be connected in no small way to the inspiration Marilyn and other members of that congregation have taken and engaged from Steve's scholarship and teaching. So in this forum, I want you to know that you all are going to uh, have the opportunity to engage with Dr. Patterson you are going to be able to offer your questions in the Zoom chat if you're in Zoom. And for those of you who are on Facebook Live, we are also taking question and answer there. And we have a colleague who is monitoring comments there. And we will try to field as many of your questions as we can uh, in the time that we have. So Steve, I want to welcome you back to Eden Seminary, your seminary, Deb's seminary, as a two degree holder, the MDiv and the DMIN. And um, we're so excited for you to share your scholarship in this 2021 Brueggemann Lecture, honoring the scholarship and the ministry of both Walter Brueggemann and 
Mary Miller Brueggemann. In the life of Eden Seminary, in the ministry and mission of the United Church of Christ, and in the ministry and mission of the progressive Christian movement. Dr. Patterson's lecture for this forum is entitled, All Children of God, Rituals of Solidarity Among the Followers of Jesus. Eden community, it's our lucky day. I give you Professor Patterson. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deb. Um, after that wonderful introduction, I have to compose myself for a moment. <laughs> uh, just thinking of um, Marilyn Stavanger and all the wonderful friends and colleagues uh, we have had over the years at Eden Seminary. Um, it's just wonderful to be with you today. First of all, to uh, celebrate uh, your inauguration as the ex-president of Eden Seminary. I, I just can't tell you how thrilled I am about that. Um, I, I know that it is, is a very hard time to, to take over the leadership of any institution. In any time, uh, churches and church institutions are tough in any, under any circumstances, but uh, especially now in this time of dual pandemic, uh, you have a, a very, very heavy load to bear. And, but I can't think of anybody better to bear it. And so uh, I'm so, so thrilled that you're, you're doing this and um, we celebrate with you. Deb sends her uh, greetings also and celebrates with you. I'm also very um, thrilled to be giving the, the Brueggemann lecture this year, um, uh, celebrating the many contributions of uh, Walter Brueggemann and Mary Miller Brueggemann to the to the to the seminary and to the church over the years. Um, Walter, of course, as a as a wonderful scholar and teacher here of many many years, uh, and uh, Mary Miller Brueggemann as a as a leader in this community, um, especially on the board of trustees in those later years, she offered such great great leadership in those in those times. So to to honor them uh, and to give the Brueggemann lecture is really a um, an honor for me. Thank you so very much for inviting me. Okay, so let's um, begin. I think, do I share a screen or is, is um, will that be done for me? You'll Should I hit share a screen? Yes, you'll share the screen. Okay, so I'll share a screen now. Um, okay, make sure that is working. Is that right? Yes, looks good. Okay, so um, I've prepared some remarks uh, for you today uh, on, under this title, All Children of God, Rituals of Solidarity. Um, it is, um, uh, let's see, the advance. Okay, there we go. Uh, it is based in some sense, it begins anyway with the basic work that I ha have done in, in the Forgotten Creed. And so uh, if that's... Uh, familiar territory to you. I apologize for that, but that's kind of where it's coming from. But I will um, depart from that uh, uh, anon. So uh, it, there'll be more than uh, what you have already seen in this book. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the Forgotten Creed, of course, is about a, 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 a baptismal creed that's buried in this um, very famous passage from Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Um, those of you who have studied New Testament at Eden Seminary or, or anywhere else will have noted that this this material here that I've just highlighted for you is the is the stuff that we're we're thinking about that's the the key material and how it stands out from the rest of the letter uh, and especially how this dyadic formulation here in um, verses in verse 28 catches our eye uh, various people have worked on this this creed, I think that I probably introduced it to most of the students at Eden Seminary um, in those years using uh, Elizabeth Schuster Firenze's work in memory of her. Um, one way of reconstructing the creed was, was this way. Um, 
No, I think I managed to. Yes, this way. This was uh, um, Dennis McDonald's uh, reconstruction of the creed in, in his book, There Is No Male and Female. Um, I ended up not agreeing with his arguments, although they are, they are certainly good and make a lot of sense. Uh, but I prefer, I guess, the analysis of, of Hans Dieter Betts in his big Galatians commentary, who identifies the elements of, creed, of the creed more or less as this. And uh, more, I say more or less because this is not exactly what uh, Betts argues, but this is what I argue in the Forgotten Creed. This is the, this is the material that I think um, actually comes from the creed. And so to, just to make it a little more clear uh, to you, uh, there it is sort of lifted out of the text and laid before us. However you reconstruct the thing, um, the most um, important material, of course, is the, the, the three dyads that form the heart of this, of this creed. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no male and female, which are easily uh, recognized as um, uh, the three elements uh, by which human civilizations in every time and every place have constructed their elaborate systems of caste. Uh, in the ancient world of Romans and Greeks and Jews, no less than any other time. Those elements, of course, are ethnicity, you might say, or, or race, I've said. Uh, uh, that is, um, using the word race to refer to this um, uh, idea in antiquity is not completely obvious, and I make an argument for it. I think it, it is more or less comparable to the kind of things that people do with race today. Um, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no barbarian Roman. There is no Greek. Um, there is no Greek or barbarian. You can substitute your own dyad there. <clears throat> there is no slave or free. That is the basic class distinction in in um, uh, the ancient Mediterranean world. And finally, of course, very obviously, there is no male and female. Uh, there is no gender. So race, class, and gender. Uh, these are the basic building blocks of ancient caste. Uh, they are the building blocks, as far as I can see, of caste in just about every time and, and every place. Um, in antiquity, it's particularly obvious because our creed is probably built um, in reaction to or in relationship to an ancient cliche. <coughs> Excuse me an ancient cliche that um, you find in various places. Here's the version that I'm usually uh, using these days. This is from Diogenes Laertius, uh, his Lives of the Philosophers. And he attributes it through Hermippus to Thales and maybe Socrates, uh, namely that he used to say that there were three blessings for which he was grateful to fortune First, that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes. That's their way of uh, speaking about slavery. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. Thirdly, a Greek and not a barbarian. That's, those are the same elements, of course, just arranged a little bit differently. Our creed turns that on its, its head. Uh, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no male and female. These things do not exist. That is to say, they do not exist as natural states that, that, um, that they're somehow inherent in, in human being. They are rather the, the product of a lively human imagination, always in search of ways to create differences, to create distinction when there is no difference uh, for the purpose of constructing uh, cast systems. The creed, of course, concludes with this statement, you are all one, and I think it's important to underscore that statement and, and exactly what it says and what it doesn't say. It, it doesn't say you are all the same, as if to will away all difference in diversity. That was the concern of um, Daniel Boyarin when he wrote about the first of these three dyads, there is no Jew or Greek in a uh, book, Paul the Apostate, several years ago. He worried that 
in a world where there is no Jew or Greek, there really is no Jew. And worried about the erasure of difference as the erasure of uh, marginal communities. Uh, and that is, of course, a, a very big part of the history of uh, Jewish and Christian relations over the millennia. So it is important. Uh, but I ultimately disagreed with him in, his, in with his reading of the creed, the creed because, you know, because of the whole thing. There is no slave and free. No one ever celebrated the differences between slave and free. No one ever said, "I'm glad I'm a slave." Don't. Don't uh, take that away from me. So this is really the creed is more about the kinds of differences people use to create hierarchies, to create caste. And so it concludes not with you are all the same, but with you are all one. Oneness does not signal sameness, in my view. It, it signals solidarity. So this is ultimately, I think, a creed that focuses on solidarity. Uh, so a first thesis, the creed in Galatians 3, 26 and 28 was not about negating difference, but building solidarity across lines of race, class, and gender. The distinctions upon which ancients constructed their elaborate caste system. So the creed is about caste. It's about dismantling caste. It's about working against caste, undermining caste, which turns us to thinking about our own caste system, caste in America. And so let's think about that for a little bit here. Um, earlier in the year, I read uh, Isabel Wilkerson's wonderful work, um, I know, uh, having talked with uh, Deborah Krauss about this book, I know that some people around there have been reading and studying this book as well. I find Wilkerson's insight to be very, very helpful, uh, which is basically that you can understand race in America if you understand that race is essentially part of a caste system. That's what it is. It's a, it's a caste system. Race is the thing that, that in all times and all places, everywhere, all the time, gives whites a sense that they belong, a sense that they are competent, that they are um, uh, on top of the world, and at the same time gives African Americans a sense of having always to defend their competence, always to defend their belonging, always to defend their uh, presence even in, in a place. This is the way caste functions, and it, it functions in a way that affects all of us. It's, it functions in a way that is completely independent of our will. Uh, it, we inherit this system. Uh, we inherited, it was invented, she's, she argues, in the 17th century to justify slavery. And when slavery ended, though, uh, the color-based caste system in America did not. It went on to justify other uh, horrors like Jim Crow and, and the whole period of Reconstruction. Um, and um, it continues to serve um, American civilization, if you will, American culture in a peculiar way. And this is a, a thing that, that King pointed out. This is a thing that James Baldwin pointed out in, in his various writings, especially the fire next time. Ta-Nehisi Coach takes it up from, from, from him. And that is that <clears throat> caste has continued to serve white Americans, especially in relationship to its class problem. That is, America has been able to delay the, the, the problem of poverty by telling poor whites that you're only really poor if you're black. And, or put other way, another way, um, um, as long as you're white, you are still free. You're, you're in the club, you're, you are enfranchised. And um, that makes you special. 
And uh, most recently, um, Heather McGee is, is argued this also point out some different aspects of it in her book, The Sum of Us. Um, uh, I don't know if you, this is, yeah, I think you probably all know this book too, because it engages so much St. Louis. As a matter of fact, here's an image, by the way, of, of, a, of a swimming pool from, this is from the early 50s, I think, in, in Fairgrounds Park. It was at the time the largest public swimming pool in the world. And uh, it becomes a, serves as kind of a parable in um, McGee's work, The Sum of Us. And her thesis basically is that um, because of caste, because of racism, white Americans never could never see themselves in solidarity with African Americans. And so only as competitors. And this is what caste does. It, it gives America's white underclass something to defend, namely their whiteness. And so um, the parable, you know, this, this pool as parable in her book illustrates a point that, that there were many wonderful things in America created for public good, among them swimming pools. Apparently swimming pools was a big thing in the early part of the 20th century, big public pools. But then in the 50s, um, uh, when civil rights began to take hold a little bit, there was a there was a push to integrate the the public swimming pools, including this big pool in Fairgrounds Park, which caused a uh, a riot, uh, a race riot, uh, uh, a white racism riot against uh, black St. Louisians who wanted to use the pool. Uh, many were killed. Many more injured. The the, the whole area around Fair, Fairgrounds Park was, was ransacked and, and attacked. And the upshot was that the pool was ultimately filled in. Um, and this is what a lot of communities did. Uh, rather than share public facilities with African-Americans, a white Americans would rather see them destroyed. So in Birmingham, Alabama, for example, they not only did they destroy their public pool, they, they closed their public parks, they closed the zoo and sold all the animals. So, uh, of course, McGee's dealing with other more serious matters like uh, welfare programs, social welfare programs. They were fine as long as they were seen to be benefiting primarily whites. But when African-Americans brought into the system, then the program becomes a problem. So, yeah, um, America has a caste problem. It always has, and, and it, it is the form that America's racism takes, I believe. I'm going to go to the beginning, though, of that, that problem, to the territory also that, that um, um, uh, that Wilkerson uh, covers. And that is to, yeah, the beginnings of caste in America and um, make another point about that. Uh, America's caste system is basically, she argues, a color-based system, white, black. But it's also, uh, it was originally also a, uh, a religious-based system. In fact, it was a religious-based system before it was a color-based system. This is what uh, Europeans brought to the America, especially from the Iberian Peninsula, the idea that you can enslave, <coughs> excuse me, you can enslave, you can enslave only unbaptized people. You cannot enslave a baptized Christian. You could only enslave unbaptized heathens, so-called. And so, um, Europeans began to enslave indigenous Americans along these, under these terms, uh, began to bring Africans to the Americas under these terms and to enslave them. Um, so um, what happened to that? Well, what happened was that um, soon African slaves began to think about baptism for themselves and indigenous Americans began to seek out baptism 
for themselves as a route to uh, freedom. So religion proved to be too malleable a barrier for the caste system that was needed to justify slavery. And so the slavers turned uh, to the color barrier and created really uh, the race concept of black and white, assigning white to the European peoples who came to this place and black to the African peoples who were being brought here uh, to work as enslaved people. White and black, the color system was invented to serve that end. Of course, um, African American slaves uh, continued to baptize, to baptize under their own terms, um, and but separately from white Christians. And so this is this is the beginning, of course, of a, a great history of segregated Christianity in America, which still perdures today. Color was the new barrier, but religion continued to play a role in. America's caste system. The reason was, I think, I'm just speculating here, but I'm just thinking the reason was probably that, that color by itself was not enough uh, to justify the enslavement of other people. And you needed religion to give that extra, which we say that moral justification, that religious justification for a terrible atrocity. And so, uh, Christianity was, was deployed again and again to justify uh, America's new caste system uh, and enslavement of others uh, in various ways. Uh, one of them, of course, is by interpreting the Bible in, in creative and odd ways, to tell you the truth, really odd ways. Um, uh, for example, the idea that the, the curse of Ham, that is... Um, Noah's son who looked upon his nakedness, the curse of Ham was that he was black or uh, the mark of Cain, the, the mark that Cain bore uh, as uh, punishment for, and actually it was not a punishment, and it, but it was re, I, reconceived as a punishment for having killed his brother Abel. The mark of Cain was that he was black. So uh, Christianity, um, was deployed to defend America's caste system. And so <clears throat> caste in America, I think, has always been defined by two things, uh, color and, and religion. And, the, and these two things have combined to, to create a kind of image of America as, uh, as uh, on the one hand, a white place, and on the other hand, a, a Christian place. And these two things have, have flowed together very, very effectively to create a kind of Americana that I suppose is what I see in these, <laughs> these images that I'm projecting uh, to you. Uh, it is what um, Mike Pompeo was saying a few months ago when he said multiculturalism, it, that is just not who we are in America. Uh, so America as Christian and white is a thing for a lot of people. So here's another thesis for you to think about. America's dominant caste was first Christian, then white, and ever after white Christian. And as you look upon these uh, bucolic images, one might think, well, that's not great, but it's not so bad. But there is another side to this, right? Uh, this uh, painting on the left with uh, baptism in Kansas painted in 1928, the height of Jim Crow, uh, the height of the resurgence of, of the KKK in the wake of World War I. Um, and so we have to remember that this white Christian America is not benevolent. It is essentially what comes to life when America's caste system is threatened. 
So another thesis to chew on. Whenever America's caste system has been challenged, white Christians have pushed back. And this is what we have seen, of course, in, in recent days. Um, I believe, I, I, I don't think this is unique at all. I, most of you believe this as well, that the rioting at the nation's capital on J January 6th was really a white Christian pushback against um, uh, the threat to caste that they have perceived. In fact, I would think that the whole Trump presidency, the whole Trump era, with its themes of white supremacy, is a fairly explicit pushback against the challenge to caste that the election of Barack Obama as America's first black president posed for people. So we are in the midst of, I would think, a period of pushback. Um, uh, white Christianity pushing back against challenges to caste in America. A big part of um, uh, the Christian religion and uh, a big part of what we've begun with today with the baptismal creed is the question of uh, ritual. Um, American Christian rituals like Christian rituals around the world are, are formative. They, rituals create world. They create the spaces that we imagine for ourselves. They create the identities that we take for ourselves. This is the, the power of ritual. So one of the questions I thought would be interesting to ask this morning is, is you know, what are the, how have our rituals helped to shape caste uh, in America? How have Christian rituals contributed to caste in America? And I want to underscore that um, <clears throat> this part of the of the talk is is pretty difficult, actually, um, because our rituals are precious to us. They're precious to me. Um, and when I think of the work around ritual that have that has been done at at Eden Seminary over the last many years. Um, all the years that, uh, that, for example, Hale Schreer put in shaping our worship life at, at Eden Seminary into a wonderful experience, reforming and re reimagining traditional Christian rituals. So the work that John Riggs did over the years and in the classroom and, and David Greenhaw has done uh, in, around the issue of worship. And then more recently, of course, Christopher Grundy's uh, wonderful book about um, the about communion, about the Eucharist. So what I'm about to go into now is, is I think you should take this as an endorsement of what has been happening at Eden Seminary and, and, and places like Eden, Eden Seminary devoted to progressive Christianity. Um, but when we think about how ritual has, has contributed to, a, to our caste system, we have to not think about that. We not have to not think about those new and wonderful and reforming things that have been done. We have to think about ritual as most people generally understand it, sort of a default understanding of our rituals, what they commonly mean. So let's go back to that picture, that, that painting of John Stuart Curry's painting, Baptism in Kansas, 1928. <clears throat> Just contemplate it for a minute. What do you see here? I think we see, first of all, in the center of the painting is the person baptized. She is, she's humble, she's penitent. And that is a, a theme of baptism. Humility is, a, is a, maybe the chief American virtue, not widely shared, but it is what we aspire to as Americans. And then surrounding her, of course, is the, the beloved community. Um, and the beloved community is connected to the scene around them. It's a farm, a prosperous farm, maybe the, the sort of the quintessential American setting. New life, new 
prosperity out there in the great west. And these new baptized are now included in the, in the blessed community. They become insiders, full participants in it. No longer children and outsiders, they are now insiders. They're moving into the blessed community. The blessings of that community are both material, the farm, and spiritual. Those the, the doves fluttering above. Baptism is basically a ritual of initiation. It's an entry into a community. It marks insider from outsider. It marks us from them. And it identifies us as those who have left behind the bad world out there and embraced the virtues of the community that we're all that we're all a, a part of. That's what baptism generally is. It's not the baptism that was presented to me and my children at, at Peace United Church of Christ just down the street there when Katie Hawker was the, the ministry. She constructed a beautiful ceremony for us around the uh, Galatians 3.28 Creed, in fact. Still, I still get verklempt thinking about that. Uh, but baptism is more fundamentally a rite of initiation by which one enters the beloved community, a community of the humble and the blessed. It marks the insider from the outsider, the us from them. Consider that in relation to caste. Let's, at the same time, let's take the other basic ritual for American Protestantism, Protestantism generally speaking, namely the Eucharist or the Supper, the Communion. Uh, what do you get when you enter the community of the blessed? You get the Eucharist. And again, um, I'm not talking about now the way in which the, the meal has been, has been reinterpreted in very thoughtful ways by contemporary progressive theologians. I'm talking about what communion has meant for centuries. The basic idea, you can see it here. The supplicant comes to the priest who offers them something very special, the transformed bread that is now the body of Christ, which since the early second century has been understood as having to do with immortality. Ignatius calls it the pharmacon Athanasius, the, 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 the drug of immortality. It is the special thing that the baptized get, the privilege of eternal life. Communion is what you get in the beloved community, symbol of the greatest gift of all, immortality. And most importantly, this gift is for insiders, not outsiders. We still say, I think Deb still says in her, Deb Patterson still says in her communion liturgy, the gifts of God for the people of God. It's about us. So let's think about that. How do these two rituals combine uh, to, what should we say, comment upon caste in America? It seems to me that uh, baptism and the Eucharist understood in this way are the perfect rituals for inculcating a sense of caste, a sense that there ought to be caste, that there ought to be insiders and outsiders, that we are part of an insider community, that we can be defined however we, we wish, but in American um, in Americana, that we is white Christianity. And as part of that insider community, you get, you get something special. You get a privilege. Those outside the community don't get the privilege. And that is, uh, that is a kind of caste way of thinking. That because you are part of this group, not the outsiders, you have 
this privilege. So something to think about. Baptism and communion, historically, traditionally, understand this is what I'm saying. I'm not talking about all the wonderful ways in which these rituals have been reinterpreted, uh, understanding exactly what I'm saying about them. But commonly understood, baptism and communion historically, traditionally, have shaped the church as a group of insiders, distinguished from outsiders by their privilege. You could perhaps not design better rituals for a caste-based society. Baptism creates the special privileged community of insiders. Communion is the privilege. So I think we have to reckon with this, that in its history, <clears throat> the church, generally speaking, has not resisted the American caste system. It has reflected it. This is something that re bears repeating. I know you all know this, but let's just make sure that we're taking it in fully. The church has not resisted the American caste system. It has reflected it. And sort of increasingly so. In, my, in 1948, <clears throat> 95% of African-American Christians worshiped in um, African-American denominations and the 5% who worshiped in white Protestant, predominantly white Protestant denominations worshiped in churches that were themselves segregated from the majority of churches in those denominations. So at the middle of the 20th century, uh, Christianity, reflected the American caste system almost 100%. And these rituals of baptism and supper meant two very different things in these two different communities. Um, in one community, entry into the blessed community was a kind of privilege an expression of the successful American life and the other community it was a kind of entry into a refuge, a refuge from uh, the caste systems that dominated our life. Could we fix this with our creeds? <clears throat> Could we fix this with the creed that Paul has transmitted for us in the epistle to the Galatians? Well, let's, let's try, let's try. I was experimenting with this the other day, and so I thought, well, just for the sake of presentation, just display this creed from Galatians over this painting by John Stuart Curry, and that, see what that does. And you can see see it now for yourself. Does that work? I don't think it does. I just don't think it does. This image of baptism and the church does not go with this creed that is all about solidarity. It, it just doesn't fit because we know too much. We know that in 1928, you know, the Klan was marching in, in Washington, D.C., not as an, an outsider invading force, but as the expression of American patriotism. We know that in 1928, African Americans were being lynched at a rate of about once a week. So it's not going to be so easy just taking this ancient creed and using it to re-enliven our, our rituals. So what, are we, what should we do with it? <clears throat> well, this creed was crafted 
by someone at the very cusp of the, of the emerging Jesus movement. Someone who is thinking about the words and deeds of Jesus and, and thinking, how, how shall we express this uh, as, as you know, a statement of who we are? And as such, it was a brand new thing. They were trying to create a brand new thing. And so I think maybe this creed is calling us to do a new thing. To do a new thing with ourselves, do a new thing with our church, do a new thing with our society that reflects the value of solidarity rather than separation. That recognizes that the way our culture has constructed its caste system and the way that the church has supported rather than challenged that caste system is calling us to do a new thing, something that has to do with solidarity. So shall we imagine new rituals, rituals of solidarity? Um, can, baptism, for example, what could we, how could we reimagine baptism as a ritual of solidarity? For one thing, it probably could no longer be an initiation ritual. And frankly, maybe we don't even really need it for that anymore. So many of our denominations practice infant baptism. That, that's not really an initiation ritual. And so many uh, adolescents that are baptized are already really part of the church. So maybe we don't need that kind of initiation ritual that baptism originally was? Could it be something like a commissioning ritual? Uh, could baptism be used to commission people to a new kind of life, to a new kind of, to a new kind of mission, a to, new kind of dedication to solidarity? Could we imagine the supper differently? Could we imagine communion differently as a kind of ritual of solidarity. There are, there are uh, resources for that in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, for example, in chapter 10, Paul mentions uh, the idea that must have been also a kind of interpretation of the, of the, of the common meal, um, that there is one bread and, and one, therefore there's one body. So there's, it's kind of a um, solidarity understanding of communion. Unfortunately, Paul uses it to un underscore the need to separate from heathens, you know, so from, from pagans who worship idols. So uh, it, in context, it's not so helpful, but uh, by itself, the image is good. Um, there's another meal tradition that we could draw upon for interpreting our communion ritual, and that is the mission discourse. And in Q, that material shared by Matthew and Luke. It's in Luke chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 9. And at the center of that um, text is um, the injunction to go forth and eat what is set before you, which of course indicates that these, uh, these people who were going out into other communities to talk about the teachings of Jesus, to talk about what they were doing, the kingdom of God, uh, they were going out to people that were not like them. They were going Jews into Gentile homes, for example. Eat what is put before you is something you'd say if you're expecting to encounter strangers and the food of strangers. Uh, they were imagining the common meal as a, as a symbol of an, an enactment of and a re realization of solidarity across ethnic lines. So what kinds of practices and rituals could we imagine to move us out of our caste-defined communities? That's really what I'm asking you to think about today. I think we might also think about a new ecumenism uh, grounded in solidarity. Um, I'll let others talk about the old ecumenism who know it better than I do, but it does seem that, that we have tried to do ecumenism on the basis of you know, shared ideas, shared beliefs, 
one church, that sort of thing. Um, but you could maybe reimagine ecumenism themed according to uh, solidarity rather than common or sameness. Rather than we are all the same, we are all one solidarity. This would mean, of course, really confronting the, the intense fragmentis, fragmentation of American Protestantism. Uh, increasingly, we are isolated in tiny communities, small, tiny denominations that really need to reach out to one another and see what we can do together. Uh, but I think the more important ecumenical work would have to do with reaching across those lines of caste that have imprinted themselves on American Protestantism. What would it mean to imagine a new ecumenism involving black and white churches, not becoming something that they're not, not becoming integrated churches, if that's not going to, if that's, I mean, this is another issue, but, but um, becoming an integrated denomination where you have black, both black churches and white churches in acting in solidarity with one another. Or could you imagine a denomination with, with Jewish communities and Christian communities both? Could we imagine ecumenism that, that way? If we're not talking about what we all agree on, we're not talking about sameness. If we're talking about solidarity, then there's a whole basis for ecumenism that emerges that is much broader, that spans uh, the, the American caste system, that, expand, that, that spans the division between religions even. Who is it with whom we are called to feel solidarity, to express solidarity? That could be anybody. A new ecumenism would have that as its theme. Finally, what we're talking about here, of course, is, is uh, a new church. The, the creed, the, the baptismal creed that I've been talking about was coined to serve a new thing, to serve a new church. It imagined a new thing. It helped people imagine a new thing. And ultimately, it is calling us to imagine a new church. I think it's calling us today to do this. As I, worship, as I watched yesterday, the worship service, the installation service, and the conversations going on around it, and I took in everything that Eden Seminary is striving for in this time and place, I believe I could see that new church on the horizon. It is a morning. Um, and this gives me great, great hope. Uh, Eden was a place where the United Church of Christ was born and that last great urge to go beyond ourselves, to become a larger community, a more embraced, embracing community. I wonder if I'm seeing that new thing, that new next urge to do that at Eden Seminary. I know I am. That's all I have for you today. I want to thank you again for inviting me to do the Bergman lecture this year. I'm truly honored and and um, to do it. And and my only regret is that I could not do it there with you. That that we could not all be together in that special place at this very special time of year. My memories of uh, Eden Convocation are, are just so, so rich. And, um, but one day, uh, hopefully one day, we'll all be together again soon. So I'll stop sharing now or... Thank you so much, Steve, my goodness. I stop right. sharing now? Is, is it off? Your screen sharing is off. I'm okay. seeing your right. face and your uh, okay. scholarly background there. Books <laughs> piled. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. Dude. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> I, I have to share, you know, Steve Patterson uh, is really to blame for me being at Eden Seminary in some ways, along with Eugene Worley on the faculty anyway. 
Uh, and I think I'm a little to blame for him being on the faculty. We were on each other's search committees. <laughs> and as a young scholar uh, living across the street from the Patterson family was always such a blessing. Uh, living across the street from an incredibly prodigious scholar in the exact same field as I was struggling to finish my dissertation was another matter. And um, here's a little story about Steve's humility and collegiality and solidarity. He was my senior colleague in New Testament. And I remember sharing with him after months and months and months of seeing his lamps on in his study. And Adam Floyd, you'll know because this is now your study. It, it was Christopher Grundy's study. Um, two lamps right up against the front window of that room that were on all night long. <laughs> I called and I would, refer, I would refer to those, Steve, as the twin pillars of truth and justice <laughs> are always fired up over there. <clears throat> And I was so intimidated by it. He's, he's at it morning, noon, and night. He's in his study. <laughs> and um, I finally came clean and said, this is really intimidating me, Steve. What are you doing? And uh, you said, oh, I, I just forget to turn them off. <laughs> <laughs> I was and, having coffee uh, in the other room is what I was doing. <laughs> So thank you uh, so much for uh, that lecture, uh, wonderful animation of your book in collaboration and connection with scholarship, Isabel Wilkerson, um, and the uh, uh, concept of caste. I know that is in your book as well. Uh, it must have been kind of an interesting connection of, of things, uh, because I believe your book came out and Wilkerson's book came out and um, they're not really on the same subject, but, but you picked up that category as, of cast uh, as well. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd kind of forgotten that I'd done that. I was reading again uh, some, of the, some of my book and, and realized I had done that. And then I realized, well, no wonder her book was so appealing to me. When I saw her book cast, I said, <laughs> I got to have that book. And and uh, every page was just enlightening to me. And um, uh, McGee's work, work uh, The Sum of Us, is also um, very helpful and enlightening along mm -hmm. adding new things to this. Um, um, as is a book that you and I, I think both read last year, uh, The Broken Heart of uh, America, St. Louis, The Broken Heart of America by, what is his name? Um, Walter Johnson. Johnson, Walter Johnson, yeah. Uh, well, I I, uh, I recall last, uh, I think it was last summer, last spring, you recommended the cast book to me and oh. uh, immediately went to my uh, must read list. And it's a powerful yeah. um, resource. Absolutely. And shaping so much of our conversation. Thankfully, um, mm -hmm. we have it. Yeah. Uh, and thankfully, we have work like yours for the ongoing work of the progressive Christian movement in such a time as this, as you outline in light of the uh, sort of white supremacist formation of so much of our ecclesial practice and way of being in uh, the United States, in the church. And um, we have questions uh, from the uh, gathered on both on Zoom and Facebook, a few questions. So I'm going to, and I see questions are continuing to come. So this is going to be a little bit of a trick for me as I'm posing questions, wanting to hear your response, looking for questions, but it's all good. Um, so there will be enough. Um, so Steve, uh, the first question is uh, from our uh, board of Trustee, uh, a colleague in ministry who I think you know well in the United Church of Christ, Stephanie Weiner. Oh, yeah. Uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Stephanie Weiner. And her question is, uh, came early on. I think she was intrigued 
really, and this is a kind of a technical text question mm -hmm. about the creed itself. Mm -hmm. So you, you have the creed ending in its original form with, for you are all one. Yes. And her question was, can you, can you share with us why the in Christ Jesus our Lord wouldn't make your cut of the original creed? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's because um, if you take seriously uh, the idea, and I, I'm, I'm very convinced by this, that Paul did not compose the creed, that he imported it from an early Christian baptismal liturgy, as, as Betts uh, argues. I think that's more convincing than the idea that Paul himself composed it for various reasons that I do spell out in, in A Forgotten Creed. Um, if you take that seriously, then you have to really look honestly at the at the wording of the creed and understand that Paul never incorporates anything without putting his fingerprints on it, that he always shapes things in in the creed. So um, the, the, the and the most obvious there are two things that are most obvious in the creed that are Pauline. One is in, uh, in the opening line, you're all children of God through faith. Well, Galatians is all about faith. Uh, that's what it is. So, I don't think you can honestly look at that and say that's probably not Paul's fingerprint. That is Paul's fingerprints. And then it just rolls into through faith in Christ Jesus. And uh, in Christ Jesus, just the in Christ Jesus part is Pauline. That the idea that that uh, what it means to be in the Jesus movement is to be in Christ. That's a very Pauline kind of concept, as you know. Uh, but then the, the very specific wording, Christ Jesus, only Paul does it that way. Everybody else does Jesus Christ. And um, so when you when you see that phrase is so Pauline that I just couldn't leave it in uh, as part of the original creed. I have to think of it as part of the um, part of the fingerprints. And that's true of the final line, too. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That also is certainly Paul's uh, adaptation of the creed in my in my humble opinion. Um, now, that is worth talking about, though, because um, one of the criticisms of this creed as a kind of um, uh, expression of solidarity is that it's not really because it's, you know, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, Daniel Boyarin's going, well, I'm sorry, that just does not help me at all. Uh, that just means there's no, if they say there's no Jew or Greek in Christ Jesus, that just means there are no Jews. And so, um, you know, on the other, on that side of things, people have criticized uh, removing those words from the original as a way of saving the creed from, say, Boyarin's criticisms. And, you know, okay, that's, you know, fair enough. Um, but I do think that I just called him like I saw him and, and that in Christ Jesus probably is Paul's adaptation to the creed. Nothing wrong with that. I keep saying, I always say to people, nothing wrong with that. It's just that we're not interested in Paul's adaptation. We're interested in what that first creed was like. Right. And I think it was like that. It just went for you are all one. Thanks, Stephanie. Great question. Wonderful to hear from you. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you all. Questions are now flooding in, of course. Um, so, uh, but, as a point of privilege, I'm sorry, I have to ask a follow-up question. Please do. Um, so on, and, and this is really about the original creed and the dyads. Yeah. And um, about, you use the term solidarity. And yeah. I wonder, it seems as though you are uh, connecting with this idea of intersectional solidarity. Yeah. That yeah. as oppressed and marginalized groups of that caste system, um, yeah. The, the members of the Jesus movement are understanding that they're called into solidarity with one another out of yeah. those formations, out yeah. of those oppressions. And, you know, yeah. I'm thinking about Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality. Of course, that's yeah. a really active term in our uh, right. discourse and thinking, yeah. Yeah. Uh, particularly around oppression. Yeah. Um, but thinking about the original creed, first of all, did it have that intersectional kind of function? Um, and if we think of Paul then adapting that creed within the context of Galatians, in the context of his, you know, leadership of the movement, he seems to be front burnering a particular diet, right? The right. Jew Greek. Right. And so 
would that intersectional imagination be falling away for Paul? Um, if you if you see, you know, his his willingness in Philemon uh, to kind of per perhaps how however you might read that letter, um, you know, not. Yeah. Uh, be as aggressively committed to solidarity yeah. in the class issue of slave or free. And yeah. in First Corinthians, you know, depending on how you read that letter, uh, but yeah. clearly seems to be kind of willing to sideline the gender solidarity. So how, how do you see that uh, originally? Is it about intersectional solidarity? And how do you see that going forward in Paul? Yeah, I think the, the fact that the creed is, is uh, formulated in those three dyads um, indicates that whoever composed it, the anonymous composer, was very much aware of what we think of as intersectionality, that you can't deal with one of these things without thinking about the others, and that they, they pile up and they compound. And so, uh, you know, a, a foreign-born woman who's a slave um, and a prostitute because she's a slave I mean, that's intersectionality in the ancient world. Freeborn um, native males, that's the top of the, you know, those, that's where the three um, dyads come together to form power and privilege. And so uh, the, the creed is really a study in intersectionality and how it expresses itself in, in antiquity, absolutely. Um, whether Paul got that or, or not is, you know, I, I, it's hard to say, but it's pretty clear, I think, from his writing uh, that he's all in on Jew and Greek, as I've uh, tried to show in this book. That and and as the new Paul, everybody's talking to you know the, from from the nineteen fifties from from Stendhal's days. Everybody's talking about this is what you need to know about Paul is that he's all in on Jew and there is no Jew or Greek. Um, but as you say exactly, he's not all in on there is no uh, slave or free. Uh, it's not that he's against, he's or unaware of the of slaves or slavery or the problems with it. Uh, it's just that he he's a he. Whenever he talks about it, he kind of dissembles. He he gets you, you never know what he's saying. You actually really don't know what he's saying. Um, and I think that's the function of his not really being all in on that and not mm -hmm. wanting to put so much on the line for that. Uh, Philemon is a good example of that. Uh, and also with uh, male and female, I think that um, he recognizes women leaders like Phoebe and in, in his in in not his churches, other churches that yeah. you know he's right. So uh, he recognizes that he, he and and bows to that even mm -hmm. um, I would say, and, and yet you know when the expression of that gets to be um, well more what should be demonstrative, like in First Corinthians eleven, where I think you have this sort of liturgical cross-dressing going on um that he's not comfortable with that he just says we don't nobody does that you know so uh if someone said to him jew and greek nobody does that he would say well we're gonna do it yeah, exactly. i'm doing it and he, you know he would get up in peter's fa face and say if you like it though you live like a jew and uh, or if you though you live like a gentile how can you tell gentiles to live like not to live like jews so it's you know he's Paul's all in on that, and he'll go to the mat for that, but he won't for these other for these other things. So he's sort of a case study in the equivocation on solidarity. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe, and and also maybe the way we get focused on one aspect, right. you know, and, issue and, um, oriented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is maybe the little danger of 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 Wilkerson's work, you know, because she she really emphasizes the white black nature of of the American caste system, which I think is right. But I know there are a lot of brown skinned people go, going out there, well, what is, where do I, you know, that's really too simple. And uh, in a sense it is. So if you can get too focused on one thing to try to act to and become so dedicated, you don't see the other issues. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, response. I'm going to, uh, out of the many questions, I just, I, I, I can feel the heat uh, of the community about my taking that much time for myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to ask a question from someone who I know was a student of yours, 
Uh, this is uh, Jessica Taft. Oh, wonderful. And um, Jessica uh, poses this. Wil Wilkerson argues that the American caste system was constructed for economic purposes and discusses the role of aspiration to economic success. So that was the sort of function of that system, um, which is the constant potential uh, reward to those in the upper caste. I wonder if you think, Dr. Patterson, a new ecumenism would also have to have economic consequences for American churches, which have fallen into that same aspirationalism that measures success by the capacity to pay professional staff and grow wealth in foundations. Yeah, yeah. So well put, Jessica, absolutely so well put. And this, if, if we take, <clears throat> if we take this, the issue, if we take the reality of the American caste system seriously and all the ways in which we are implicated by it um, and begin to change accordingly, it's going to, it's going to be economic. It's going to be painful uh, for white Americans. Um, but, um, you know, there are, our church, I think the United Church of Christ has begun to take steps along these lines, the reparations uh, to uh, Hawaiians for years ago that took place uh, are part of that. Uh, I think probably churches like the United Church of Christ are going to have to, you know, do these things more symbolically than uh, effectively because, frankly, the resources, now our resources are diminished so much from what they were, say, in the 1950s. But um, uh, but it would still be a powerful thing for all of these uh, older American Protestant denominations to be in solidarity, say, with the older uh, historic uh, Black denominations. Uh, and I think that would ultimately have consequences. It might have economic consequences. It might involve economic commitments. But frankly, in, in many cases, in most cases, those historic black denominations are going to be the senior partners. Uh, they're going to be the larger and more vigorous organizations, uh, oftentimes at, at this stage. So um, maybe this could be seen as the, the old historic white denominations coming hat in hand uh, at a point when they when they need more help. Uh, and so it's sort of a reverse uh, role. Uh, just one com a comment. I was kind of sputtering around there when I talked about that and the new ecumenism. And I wanted to make, I guess I wanted to just clarify what I was saying. Um, you know, I think back in the 1960s when white, these older white Protestant denominations like the United Church of Christ, like the, the Congregationalists, uh, quote unquote, opened their doors to blacks. And um, I always have found that to be a, a very troubling expression. And, you know, I've tried to point out on various occasions that, you know, white denominations opened their doors to blacks, but blacks did not come in. And, and gee, guess why? This is not Major League Baseball. This is not, you know, so after three centuries of saying, you know, we're white and you're black and that's why we can't be together, that after three centuries of that, to just say, well, we've changed our minds now and expect that that African Americans are going to want to join white churches for some reason. It's just kind of dumb, really. And, and so uh, I think going forward in a kind of new ecumenism that tries to, to um, form lines of solidarity across the black white caste divide, um, white churches are going to have to be careful to understand that this is not about integrating your churches. This is not about getting black people to come to your churches so that you can feel better about your church. Um, this is going to be about forming real genuine relationships of solidarity, probably with black congregations that want to stay, uh, uh, remain as a black congregation where all, where all those traditions, those rich traditions um, are, are intact and, and don't, they don't want to compromise that understandably. So uh, it might involve white people joining um, black churches, but you know, just so you don't gentrify black churches then, you know, something like that. So <laughs> with all the complex history behind us, it's going to be difficult to negotiate this and figure it out. 
But I think we can figure it out if we try to figure it out together. As people there in Webster Groves are trying to do, I know that there are some great new initiatives going on there. Yeah, and so I think thinking of our, our church buildings and our congregations, our, our capacity to organize uh, on, in, in solidarity. Um, you know, I think there, those are the ways you see the, the sort of emergence of that new communism happening. You see signs of it um, and, uh, toward a solidarity. So um, we are uh, coming up on our time. I wonder if I could maybe uh, pose one more question. Um, there was uh, a question from uh, Dr. Niles. Mm. If you wouldn't mind in a, in a global context, um, and I, I, I just, I'm not certain that I have the uh, uh, question, I have a, a cut and paste of her question, so I hope I have it right. But asking you, um, what are the lines of connection in comparison of US India, right? So I think she's talking about a different, mm. thinking of these dynamics and dyads in a different context, US India and Christianity Hinduism. Can you talk a little bit about that? Are there, are there ways to take this out of the rich, powerful reading of the North American context and the challenge of it and help us see the implications of it in another context? That's a great, great, wonderful question. Uh, Dr. Niles, Damianti, thank you so much. I was actually thinking about that yesterday, uh, about Christianity in India and, and, the, and the question of caste. Um, it, Wilkerson talks so much about you know, comparing American caste and Indian caste. Um, and just two observations that came to mind, I, and that's all I have, is just these two observations that I haven't really figured out yet. But one, on the one hand, um, Christianity has always appealed to Dalits in, in, in India. And so that sense of um, uh, being a tradition that feeds and um, uh, yeah, that feeds the underclass, the outcast, uh, the, the, the oppressed, as the Dalits are the oppressed caste. Uh, so there, the creed sort of functions in its natural environment. And uh, people respond to the, the tradition in that way. On the other hand, Christianity has also been associated with the, the, the upper caste in India and all of the institutions that Christians founded in India are the institutions where high caste people, high class people, rich people go. All the schools are, uh, the most prestigious schools are all the Christian schools. All the hospitals are most prestigious hospitals are Christian hospitals. So there also is the, you know, how the cast, the way that Christianity has become part of uh, Western civilization's caste system, you know, pushes into the Indian context there and that way as well. So um, I really don't know what to make of you know, the, this, these two very different phenomena. On the one hand, Christianity is functioning at as it ought to among Dalits. And the other hand, it's functioning as a very elite kind of authorization for the highest castes in India. I, I don't know what to do with that, Tommy. I, I really don't. That's a very interesting question. Well, this is an unfortunate uh, reality that we can't have the back and forth that we would have in the Worley Chapel about that because I'm sure we would have a great conversation going in and then we would be able to all go to lunch together right now in the Schreer Commons. Um, but I'm, I'm certain uh, folks are uh, in, in fact becoming hungry themselves perhaps. <laughs> and uh, we certainly however have been richly blessed and filled with this wonderful opportunity to gather with you Steve to to hear you open up uh, your work and its really, really powerful uh, application uh, to the church and challenge to the church, the progressive Christian movement. And I, uh, I really do thank you so much for, for being here and for that.
Thank you, Deb, and, and blessings on you and blessings on the Eden community as you embark on the, this new phase of its life. And, um, you know, great things are ahead. It's, you know, in every way, in every way, in every way. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to have you. And, and you know, the, the one good thing about this kind of stuff uh, through the difficulty of COVID is it, it really helps us see how we can be connected and, and engage with one another in ways when we are physically separated. Yeah. So thank you. All right, well, uh, we, uh, we just wanna thank Professor Patterson and we will uh, be moving forward in our convocation schedule uh, after today for the Cooling Camp lecture tonight. Uh, featuring a forum in which uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman, uh, a, the Associate General Minister of the United Church of Christ and currently Eden's uh, pastor in residence will be offering a set of reflections on conversations about uh, congregations that are navigating the very kind of opportunities for solidarity and institutional and missional transformation that Dr. Patterson has just invited us into thinking about. Um, examples perhaps where, where this kind of transformation may be at work. Launching into solidarity, community partnerships and congregational purposes. She will be reflecting with me on four different examples of such congregational partnerships with uh, community-based ministries and how these ministries are really drawing, launching the congregation into new spaces and new solidarity. So please join us for this forum. You will use the same link and we will gather here at 5.30 central uh, time, 5.30 p.m. for that forum. Tomorrow, we have another full day of forums. The first highlighting the global partnerships for solidarity with Eden's International Alumni, led by uh, Dean Niles and uh, Dr. Mary Shallard Blaufus, who will uh, host that conversation with Eden's alumni, brilliant conversation. And then at 5.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon uh, to gather with uh, Reverend Dr. Dietra Baker, our visiting professor of contextual education and community engagement um, with Eden alumni, one of whom is the Reverend Dr. Deborah Patterson, state senator in Oregon, who will be uh, gathering with others uh, among our alumni who are in ministries in the public square. And so uh, Reverend Dr. Baker will be opening up that space to think about ministry and the progressive Christian movement in those public square spaces and leadership in those spaces. Uh, each night, uh, tonight and tomorrow night, we have more reunion. So uh, look at the schedule for that and opportunities to gather with classes and um, share in reunion time. Thanks so much for joining. Be sure to fill out your uh, evaluation in the chat and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for tuning in today.